calling us to order at 902. Taylor, if you could do the roll call, please. Juliet Ballard. <clears throat> Marna Larson. Marie Gress. Here, calling in from Milan, Michigan. Margie Reynolds. Elizabeth Thompson. Here, calling in from Ypsilanti Township. Jennifer Green. Present, calling in from the city of Ypsilanti. Phyllis Herzig. Present, <clears throat> calling in from Ann Arbor. Bruce Strain. Calling in from Ann Arbor. Jennifer Heckendorn. Present, calling in from Ann Arbor. Brenda McKinney. Jasmine Cooper. Present from Pittsville Charter Township. Allison Foreman. Present, calling in from Ypsilanti Township. Amy Somerville. I will, I saw some people join in, so Julia Ballard. Present, calling in from Dexter, Michigan. Marta, Marta Larson. Um, participating from Northfield Township, Michigan. Margaret Reynolds. Calling in from Pittsfield Township. We have quorum. Wonderful. Um, a slight adjustment to our agenda this morning. Um, the emergency preparedness uh, presenter is not able to come. He emailed me this morning. So we'll find a time to reschedule him. And then the weatherization, I couldn't find someone who was available today for weatherization. So we will not have that, um, those presentations today. Um, so with that adjustment to the agenda, I'll go next to public participation. Any members of the public would like to share? I see, I'm assuming it's Monica, allow to talk. And then Barbara, I see your hand next. Hi, um, oops, yes, I am uh, Monica Prince <laughs> from the Ipsy Senior Center. Um, I just wanted to comment about the commissioner's ideas on um, what the aging network would be uh, after the millage, if we get the millage. I am very disturbed that most of the money is going to bureaucratic um, infrastructure into the county. Um, there's not a whole lot. I mean, this this millage was hopefully for uh, agencies that need, were struggling with what they were doing because of the growing population of older adults. And by putting everything into county infrastructure, that's not going to help. Um, what we need is May, we need an office on aging, but for it to be a organization, part of the county, I think, but uh, separate in that it um, is able to distribute the monies to agencies that need it right now and not have, um, you know, it all go towards personnel. And one of the things is, I, I haven't looked at it really closely, I admit, but a lot of times the county administrators end up getting huge salaries and none of the nonprofits are getting any kind of salary, hardly anything. It's not um, anywhere compared to what the county does. So it, um, and they have benefits and everything else where a lot of the nonprofits that are doing senior services don't have that kind of thing. Um, I've worked here for 18 years and I have finally gotten a uh, retirement plan. Um, it, it's like we just were able to take care of it. So. It's. I'm just want to say that I need. I think the COA really needs to step up 
and help direct where this money is going to be going. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Monica. Friendly reminder to everyone that we can't respond now. We respond in the next item agenda. Um, all right, so next is Barbara, and then Gary, I see your hand after that. Oh, I think I accidentally muted you. Ask, can you unmute, Barbara? There we go. Sorry, Sorry about that. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It is so great to see you all this morning and on what looks like to be on tap, a beautiful fall day. Um, you know, um, Monica, I'm glad you're here talking about this issue. Um, I echo your concerns and um, I've been in touch with, I think, 60% of the commissioners with um, conversations on tap for the next couple of weeks that needed to be scheduled. And um, just as an FYI, Justin and Andrew are coming to deliver um, a route this month. So um, that might help with some, a little bit of understanding. Um, so um, yeah, you, you've said everything I had to say. I had some very concerns structurally and content wise. And um, one idea I had was what would it look like to incubate something like this? in the Office of Community and Economic Development, or somewhere. I mean, just to have a whole department starting brand new um, when they're asking us to be competitive um, concerns me. Um, so that, I, that's all I have to say about that. And um, I'm happy to share much, much more. But I wanted to get to um, what I came on for this morning. Marie and I had a chance to catch up about a variety of things. I'm lucky to have someone like her to work with in the community as all of you. And um, she asked if I could come to provide an update about what's going on with um, our plans for securing our vehicles. Um, since the time that I came in and shared what happened, um, I took to heart and, and looked into all of the suggestions that you all provided, everything from working with maybe WCC students for a build and you know, thinking through some of the things. And um, after laying everything out on paper and thinking about ROI and costs and timing, it landed to the point that we really just need to, and we found a, um, a group out of Dexter that is um that builds these kinds of things and you know i have to say we the staff have voted to call it the garage mahal so um we are so if you accidentally say that that's what i'm meaning um and um we're actively fundraising for that right now um the county is the county and um OCED working with Ageways is looking to see if there are any leftover ARPA dollars. Um, I've reached out to Ipsy, Ipsy Township because I think some places might just have like a handful or none, you know, and that's a reality too. And um, we're working with a couple of current donors on a one-time, you know, gift in this for, for the garage. So, um, we're still fundraising for it and um, happy to answer any questions that you might have. And I should share First Baptist Church has been amazing um, as we've been going through all of this too, so. Great, thank you, Barbara. Uh, Gary, you are next. Well, thank you and good morning to everybody. Um, so yes, um, we got to see the county's first, very first draft of what they think this uh, millage model might look for. And uh, I, I, like all of you, <laughs> had some very strong and emotional responses to when I first saw this draft. But I, I just want to say a few things about where we are. We are in the very, very early uh, stages of this process of negotiating and working, collaborating with the county. This process is gonna be, it's gonna be an iterative, ongoing and lengthy process, no doubt. And um, I agree that we, I think we need to do our homework to be able to articulate what our priorities are. Um, 
but I think we also need to pause for a moment and, and, and be aware of how this process will unfold. Just as we have, you know, been engaged and very intent upon reviewing this first model, I can guarantee you that the county is likely in a very similar pattern. Uh, many, if not all, uh, most of the commissioners, this was their first time of seeing that model on September the 18th. And I think what we witnessed there that evening was this sort of first time emotional response. Uh, you know, it's a, it was a wide range of responses that I would categor categorize as initially initial responses, and they lack the benefit of careful thought and consideration. So I am certain that the model that was presented to us on the 18th will be will be different the next time we see it, if only because of the discussions that have happened internally at the county and the conversations that they're hearing from other people. So I think for us at this point, uh, this is just one person's opinion. I think we really should be cultivating the discussion of establishing what our priorities are, uh, defining them clearly and being able to articulate them. We have a long way to go in this process. And I think it's a little bit early now to take a stand on strong position statements. I think we need to be ready to, to uh, collaborate and discuss this with the commissioners. Um, I think, you know, if we have a clear and informed understanding of our priorities and we mix that with a little discretion and consideration, I know that we will come to a powerful outcome uh, for these hoped for millage dollars. Thank you for your time this morning. Yeah, thank you, Gary. Uh, Justine, I see your hand. Uh, I'm not on the video, but it doesn't make any difference. We we wanted to come back uh, and talk to you about Teresa's Law. And um, we uh, submitted some uh, further information. And, um, you know, we're asking for your endorsement uh, for Teresa's Law and uh, some support and advocacy. So I wanted to uh, bring that up again to the group. Yeah, thank you, Justine. Any other public like to say anything? Great, then we are gonna move to the commission response to public participation. Um, I'll go first really quick as it relates to Teresa's law. That's going to be our next agenda item is um, asking further questions, getting clarification from uh, Justine and Patricia um, about that. And we had started drafting a motion last time and we should finish that in this meeting. Um, so more conversation to come on that. And then in um, my report from the chair, I have... A, a discussion planned on the presentation that Andrew did for the Office on Aging and Millage Priorities. Um, so you guys are, are welcome to comment and respond to what the public had said, but I, I do want to note that we have a good chunk of our meeting later for, you know, that additional stuff. So... Anyone else like to uh, respond to the public at this time? All right, great. Then with that, we'll uh, close commission response. Um, we need to approve the minutes from September 6th. Would somebody like to make that motion? Juliet. Anyone yes. want a second? Margie, I see Margie second. So Taylor, I believe you have to do a roll call for us. <clears throat> Juliet Ballard. Yes. Margie Larson. <clears throat> yes. Marie Gress. Yes. Margie Reynolds. Yes. Elizabeth Thompson. She's saying. It's muted, but I saw it. <laughs> uh, Jennifer Green. Yes. Phyllis Herzig. Yes. 
Bruce's stream. Yes. Jennifer Hackendorn. Yes. Brendan McKinney. Jasmine Cooper. Yes. Allison Foreman. Yes. Annie Somerville. Motion passes. Super. All right. So the first item of discussion is to the old business of Teresa's Law. When Justine presented to us last time, there were a few final questions that several of us had that we asked for them to um, get those answers and come back to us and we could finish drafting a motion of support. So Justine, I'm going to promote you to panelist and Patricia, I see you here. And so I'm going to, oh, you switched on me. Uh, I'm going to promote you to panelist. Hopefully that worked. Yeah, I'm rejoining as panelist. Great, so first I'll turn the floor to uh, the two of you, Justine and Patricia, um, to update us on those questions and answers, uh, and then we'll go to discussion. Good morning, I'll start. Uh, Justine, if that's okay with you. Um, thank you all so much for having us back uh, today. I really appreciate your time and consideration of Teresa's Law. Uh, and I apologize for not being able to make it last month. Um, but I did want to address the questions that I have um, that I believe we've captured uh, from last month's meeting. And if you have any others, please feel free to, to ask those. But uh, I'll just take these one at a time. Uh, the first one I had was, will the cost of training be passed on to the direct care worker? And no, the answer, short answer is no. Uh, the All the training and continuing education requirements are part of the adult foster care homes licensure requirements. So they would be solely responsible for any cost associated with any training. And that is in keeping with the current regulations. Uh, the second question I had is, uh, why is accountability not included in the substitute bill? And the original bill was very heavy. And so what we're doing is we are breaking it down into smaller bills just so it's more manageable and we can prioritize some of those things that we feel are most important. And so that's why we're moving forward with uh, training and transparency requirements now. And then accountability will be addressed at a later time next session. Uh, the other question I had was Teresa's Law based on other states. And yes, it was. Uh, we actually did a state-by-state -state comparison of all 50 states plus the District of Columbia. And so Teresa's Law is based on what other states are doing. And it's also based on the top uh, violations uh, that we found through the statistical data that we pulled for four years. And so if you have any questions as I go through these, feel free to interject, but I'll just kind of keep going through the list here. Uh, we do have a report, by the way, of that state-by-state -state, uh, comparison. If you would like to see that, we will be happy to get that to you. Um, the other question I had is on my list, will the Teresa's Law Medication Administration training replace Washtenaw County training? And no, it will not. Um, Lara, I just want to expand a little bit on that. Uh, Lara does set the training requirements uh, at a statewide level. It doesn't set them at a county specific level. Uh, there is some additional training uh, that is required uh, for homes that serve those with mental illnesses. And that training is provided through the Community Mental Health Partnership. And so Teresa's Law training uh, would not replace that. Uh, the only homes that would uh, need to take the medication training through that Teresa's Law is proposing would be those homes that do not serve uh, populations uh, with mental illnesses or those homes that do serve those with mental illnesses and are not certified. Uh, certification is not mandatory. So there are some homes that serve uh, those with mental illnesses that have chosen not to be certified. And then so they would need to take the Teresa's Law medication training. And of course, any training that we are proposing through Teresa's Law that is not required through the um, uh, community health partnership training, that, that would be the only additional training that those homes would need to take. 
I hope that answers your question on, on the on the medication training. So th those are all the questions, Marie, that I had uh, on my list that were asked last meeting. Um, I, if there's any others, I'd be happy to uh, address those at this time or. If anyone has a question, raise your hand. Juliet. Hi, thank you for presenting. I just have um, one question. So it doesn't, the cost doesn't go to the caregivers. However, um, the caregivers receive a particular salary, which in Washtenaw County, specifically we're advocating for caregivers wages to be increased. Um, it would become a uh, cost to the actual licensee, correct? That's correct. Providing services That's that, correct. that would then ultimately affect the caregiver's salary, correct? I'm not sure I understand. Um... So, so if uh, the state reimburses the licensee a particular amount per hour for care and the company... Um, wants to provide benefits to the caregivers for retention, i.e. health insurance and basic costs for them to be employed, which are, are need, it needs to be improved in our county. If the licensee is then required to provide additional trainings and other things, um, it could compromise or lower the salary of the workers because it would have to come from somewhere, correct? And then my second, my second question is um, to provide medication training for it to be sound and reliable, it probably should be uh, presented by a nurse oh, yes. or someone that is yeah. responsible or licensed right. to provide that training. Right. And um, that would be another cost to the agency that would then oftentimes affect the caregiver's wages that would then ultimately affect the amount of caregivers available to service our older population in Washtenaw County. So I just I understand the law and I and I appreciate it and I, I think it's viable. I just think it has a lot of implications um, that we're not considering. Um, that if you would let me comment on that, Julia. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, <clears throat> okay. So one of the things that you know, we're not trying to address employer issues, I mean, that are chronic and longstanding in the industry. And you find that at every level of care. Uh, and what we're trying to do is support the uh, caregiver. And one of the things that you see when you read the industry newsletters um, is turnover is a tremendous cost and retention is a tremendous cost and um, the impact on morale when people leave and they're shorthanded. Um, so this needs to be a part of the um, equation uh, also. Um, and, um, you know, we can't, um, the, um, the education of the caregiver has more benefits uh, than it does uh, downsides to residents and their families and the industry. So I think we have to, you know, consider those factors also. I'd like to just uh, expand a little bit on what Justine said on that. Um, so we're, we're looking at both the caregiver, the benefits of the caregiver and the resident. Uh, medication errors are the number one cited violation for the past four years across all sized homes. And some of them had really devastating, have devastating consequences. And we've read some really horrific stories. Um, and my mother's death was hastened, uh, we firmly believe, uh, because of the staff was not trained uh, in medication administration. Um, right now, the requirement by the state is just to watch two online videos for less than 25 minutes. So it's very, uh, direct care workers are, are not prepared um, to recognize side effects to recognize, you know, uh, when things go wrong. And so that's what we're, we're trying to close that gap. And I will say uh, the state regulatory authority uh, does have in their training videos, and we've discussed this, that 
uh, the stress and that is put on the direct care worker when they are not fully trained in medication administration has lead, led to turnover. Um, so uh, that that's, those issues are really tied together. And so there's two. There's also two um, direct care worker groups that uh, study policies and issues that that impact them, uh, Impart Alliance and uh, PHI. And they estimate that it costs facilities $2,600 per year per direct care worker uh, on turnover when they leave. So there is a high significant cost to not only direct care workers, but to the providers uh, by not training their staff and retaining them and giving them a career advancement. Um, the Michigan Health Endowment Fund estimates those costs to be much higher uh, to homes. They estimated to be between six and seven thousand dollars a year for each direct care worker turnover. So, uh, by not training the staff, not only are we putting residents at risk, but we're causing more stress and uh, burnout of the direct care worker. And it's it's a cost to providers, and it's also uh, there's also I believe some implications to the taxpayer. There's a, uh, a in most instances, 911 is called when there's a medication error, uh, there's hospitalization, so there's more cost to um, the resident, not only financially, but obviously to their health as well. So um, there is so much uh, benefit to providing training. Uh, so many uh, areas are going to see improvements from that, not the worker, the resident, uh, and the providers. It really is a win-win situation. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, Juliet, your hand uh, went back up. So if you would like to comment and ask your next question, floor is yours. Um, Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I, um, I, I understand what you're saying. I think that, um, the accountability, it would be wonderful if this law had the accountability with the state to provide the training. I know that in Washtenaw County, um, community mental health has a training and they provide the nurse to nurses. They hold a one day class. Um, they test the caregivers. They come back and it's um, comprehensive. Uh, there's a lot of accountability but it's something that is integrity driven um, by the county because they have the particular standards that they like upheld. Um, that would be helpful if the state could provide a service for that because um, I could see it becoming the training becoming inconsistent between one licensee from another. I could see that um, a lot of uh, Companies wouldn't um, have a nurse, a licensed person giving the training. So you wouldn't want a layman person giving the training for medications. Um, and I think that would be very helpful or something to include in the law to make it um, make it a better law. Um, because I think I think the the thought behind it is wonderful. I think that the the um implied results that you would like to have. I'm not sure that they would be consistent across the board or it wouldn't kind of just be a band-aid on a larger issue rather than having it more um, thought out and more consistent and more accountability across all boards to the licensee, to the state and to the caregiver. Julia, and you, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. You you highlighted some really important things, and you talked about inconsistency in the state providing it. And so right now there is that's all there is is inconsistency because there are no standards at all, and so it's left up to facilities to decide what they want to do. So we are trying to bring that some of that standardization in. And so we are laying out because right now all the state says in their in the regulations that you must be trained in medication administration, but it does not tell you how to do it other than watching two videos, which is just recommend suggestions. So we're laying out some standards and we do have that the, in the bill that the training must be provided by a medical professional. Mm -hmm. right. So that is in there. And we also have in there that. Uh, in the instance where training is not live or hands 
done, if it's provided through a by a medical professional, let's say through a video, that there needs to be a live person available. It has to be interactive where students can ask questions and you know get their questions immediately answered. So it is we are introducing some standards. So it is consistent across the board. Uh, and I will tell you, as far as the state running that program, the state does not want to run the program. They do, you know, because we do have the original bill did have a role in there for a certified med aid that um, this is a new role that was created for nursing homes. And we wanted that role created for assisted living. Um, that's something for a long term goal that we are still go going to advocate for, because that would that would set the standards and that would. Uh, take the training off the hook from the adult foster care facilities, uh, but that's long term. So right now there is a desperate need for more training. You know, in the meantime, while we wait for that, residents are being harmed. Uh, direct care workers are being put in put in um, unfair positions um, to be able to you know to administer these medications with without any training. Um, so the training needs to be there. It is there for certified homes that serve the, those with mental illnesses, that same training should be given across the board to all homes. And that's what we are trying to do. So it will introduce those standards that you talk about. Uh, right now, like I said, there's none. So, uh, you know, we are trying to uh, put some of that in, put some of that in place. So I hope that answers your question. I, I agree with what you say. There needs to be some standards and that's what we're shooting for. Yeah, it it did answer my question. And I, I, <laughs> I understand when you say the state doesn't want to take on the responsibility of doing the training, but I also understand on the ground and the reality of finding uh, these home care companies, finding medical professionals and hiring them to be on staff to facilitate this oh. training. And no, no, no. We did. If I could just going to be, they're staff. not, the staff does not, the homes do not hire these uh, uh, medical professionals where, to be on where staff. Would they, where would they yeah. come from? There is training, uh, the Michigan Assisted Living uh, mm -hmm. Association provides training and Heart Alliance provide training. There are a ton of providers out there that some of the homes are already using for other training. So the training is there. The mm -hmm. training is already there. They don't have to hire more staff for this training. So I thought, that, I thought, she, said, I thought she said during the training, a medical professional would have to be present. The and medical professional would provide the person. training. Uh, so the medical professional would provide the training. Now, a lot of training is done uh, through webinars, through videos, through Zooms. So it does have to be by a medical professional, but there are uh, providers that do that. Like I mentioned, mm -hmm. Empire Alliance, the Michigan Assisted Living Association. We want to make sure that there is somebody there. We don't want them just to watch a video and then not have someone to answer their questions. So regardless of who that person is, they answer their questions. So we're just, you know, putting that interactive piece in there, but, but it's not a staff that these facilities have to go out and hire. Yeah. And I just wanted to make one more note, um, a comment, and then I'm, I, I'll be finished with my comments in Washtenaw County. Our caregivers aren't here and untrained with, for medications. They are trained mm -hmm. extensively, uh, in Washtenaw County, there's a very high standard for training, um, that is audited and regulated continuously. Um, with medication audits and other things. I, I understand um, your concern, uh, but there is something in place in this particular county uh, for that, for them. So I, I Could don't- Could you expand on that, present. Julia? Because- uh, the, so, um, so in order, in order to be a caregiver working on a floor with residents, you have to pass a medication exam. If you go on the Washtenaw County uh, website, there's a medication exam held at least once every other week. So before staff can even pass meds, they have to pass a medication exam. So they have to go to a class and then they have to take a test. There's a PowerPoint for their exam. There's a study guide for the exam that each caregiver receives. After they pass their test, they have to be watched by another person that has passed meds at least 10 times before they pass the meds. And then every year, they have to recertify to be able to pass meds. So I don't want it to be presented as though in Washtenaw County, we have people working that don't know anything about meds or confused and they're just making mindless med errors because they are untrained. That that would be um, un, that would be false um, in our particular area. I'm not sure about other counties, but I know 
positively in Washtenaw County. That's the standard. Are you referring to the community mental uh, health training? Yes. 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 Well, okay, that's... so those would be those are AFC homes that are certified. Right. That's in license. Mm -hmm. A and large right, number. Yeah, those are for mentally ill population. Yes. So we're trying to get that same standard for other homes that do not serve the mentally ill. They, and for they, those they they also serve adult foster care homes and they also serve other areas in Washington County. But adult foster care that serve the yes. mentally ill yes. that are certified. Yes. I, yes. yes. Yeah. But there are other adult foster care right. homes that don't fall within that category. Right. And those are the ones that we're trying to address. And, and those homes are particularly people that are smaller businesses that um, have their licenses and that need support. Um, I understand the rationale, but I want to be honest and forthright about the people in our community that these, I can't honestly see these small home care companies going out and having a medical professional on staff to do this. I think it should be just if I could just finish. Mm -hmm. If it could be presented like in Washtenaw County, where the state provides a class, a test, consistency and accountability, but the state saying from what you're saying, no, we don't want the responsibility to do that. We want these small home care companies to do that, that are already struggling and that are struggling struggling to keep their caregivers that are paid a per, uh, a small per diem to keep their uh their people safe and then to add a whole nother layer of something else i think there should be some accountability across the board from the state the licensee and the caregiver i think in history we've put all the responsibility on the caregiver sometimes all of the responsibility on the licensee or all the responsibility on the state and I think that doesn't that doesn't benefit our population at all. I think it's a quick fix and it makes everybody feel better to say this is what we've done. However, the lasting effect of it is is not helpful. And then I and then I, I will stop talking. I'm sorry. Everybody have a <laughs> don't apologize. Thank you, Juliet. Um, I have Bruce and then Elizabeth. I see your hand. You can rest it for a little bit. Sure. <laughs> so Bruce, then Elizabeth, and Margie. I was starting to get worried about Elizabeth with her hand up in the air, but um... yeah, my phone is not working well with Zoom today, so I can't press the little hand. <laughs> um, I appreciate very much the conversation. It's a it's an important and a very complicated issue, but. I really want to offer full and robust support for what Juliet is saying. I think her understanding, her experience, her insights, along with your advocacy from Patricia and Justine, I think we need to find a way to bring those together because my fear is this is an industry that's increasingly unaccountable and increasingly greedy. And I think the short end of it, uh, uh, of the stick, always falls with the care workers. Care workers are not as organized as they could be. They're starting to get more organized. They need to have a more comprehensive plan in place because I think what will happen is <clears throat> under the, the guise or the argument of, well, we've given education and we've given training, um, the other issues of accountability, of turnover, of lack of support, of lack of salary will kind of fade into the background as they always do. So I think my concern, and I, I appreciate the work you guys are doing, but my concern is you may be giving up some strong leveraging right now to get the training and education piece in. And I realize how critical that is. My mother went through very much the same kind of challenges in a number of facilities, and we had to monitor it like crazy. But um, I do worry if we separate, and I understand on one hand the strategy of trying to break up legislation, but I worry that we lose the leveraging to put together a more comprehensive package. Too many times we've seen legislators and others say, well, look, we're, we, we, we gave you something, but they didn't give you what you really, really need, which is a more comprehensive approach to this. And I do worry about that. And I think you know, Juliet's insights to this are invaluable. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth? I agree with uh, Bruce, um, this is, um, and Juliet, it, it is a complex problem. 
Uh, we have providers who range from out-of-state companies to mm -hmm. individuals providing services. And I think um, the state has not fully addressed in any way, shape, or form <laughs> the issues related to the direct care workforce. They're beginning to. But I do think um, training should be seen in a more comprehensive context. I know I missed the last meeting for which I'm sorry, but I would really like to know where the state's direct care worker task force is on this issue and how it folds in to uh increased funding and I right now do not feel like I have the knowledge to vote in to support this bill as the best strategy for what is unquestionably a major concern. Um, I think if the commission wants to continue to address this issue, this needs further con uh, conversation um, and touching base with more thoroughly with the Impart Alliance, uh, which does sponsor, does advocate for a 72 hour training and certification for direct care workers where it is uh, paid so the direct care worker does not have to front the cost of it. Um, I do think piling on requirements without also addressing the issue of direct care worker pay is not going to be helpful um, because it is a, a system that is many, many parts. So I guess I would suggest that if the commission as a whole wishes to find out more about the issue. Perhaps this is something they want to form a work group on. But uh, Bruce, I agree with Bruce. You give up a lot of leverage if you focus in on one issue and don't look at statewide implications, the provision of a statewide training and address the issue of how this is going to be funded. Uh, Maria, if I could just uh, uh, mm -hmm. address a couple of comments that were made, and Justine, you may want to add on to it. Um, as far as from a legislative standpoint and having leverage, you know, to get a complete package, the initial bill did have uh, all those things addressed in it. We are taking uh, our advice um, and expertise from really the legislators. The legislators are the ones that said this, we want to break this down into smaller, smaller bills. Um, and so that's what we're doing. I will say the lobbyist group doesn't want any of it. So uh, they're trying to keep things as status quo. And that's that's the big uh, brick wall that we're, we're running against. So we felt in Rep Young feels that it is more advantageous to break these down into smaller components and, and get some of those critical things passed because right now training is a need to, to, to say the problems are so vast that we can't do anything. I don't do not believe that is the right answer. Um, direct care, the direct care workers need the training and quite frankly, the residents need for them to be trained in these areas. It's not about having them take on more, more responsibility. This is about equipping them to handle the responsibilities that they're already being asked day in and day out to do. Uh, it's happening now. And so to say until we fix all problems, we're not gonna train the staff, I, I don't think that's the right answer. Uh, they need training. It's it's a um, someone had brought up, Justine and I were talking about this. It's, it's like saying there's a, a shortage of firefighters. So let's not train the 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 firefighter firefighters that we do have, you know, to do their job with safety precautions and competency. Uh, nobody nobody would would expect that. Same with police. Same with you know any position where people's lives are at stake. 
So regardless of, of if they have accountability or we have uh, you know some standards across the state, there is a need right now for training. And the training that we're proposing, we've been in uh, communication with the Impart Alliance. It is very much in keeping with the competencies that they are laying out uh, for this uh, license or certificate, it's not license, but uh, certification of direct care workers, but it is not mandatory. And so Teresa's law will make it mandatory. Impart Alliance is uh, one of the providers that these facilities could, could use for that training. So. Uh, it is very much in keeping with that, but keep in mind the Impart Alliance uh, training is not mandated. There will yeah. need to be uh, legislative changes made to mandate some of that training, uh, and that's what Teresa's Law would do. I um, might add that the Impart Alliance training is free, and yeah, there yeah. are sources that are free, and so it wouldn't be a burden of cost. It would just be a matter of, of identifying it and um, making it uh, available. So, you know, there are resources out there and the that state are credible. Have, oh, I'm sorry, Justine. The state does have some of the other training that we are recommending in Teresa's Law. The state already provides free uh, training resources for those. We're just mandating it through Teresa's Law. Right now, it's it's not mandated. Um, Teresa's Law would just say that these facilities have to take, you know, the training courses that we've outlined. But it is there's a lot of free resources out there. Mm -hmm. That 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 have um, uh, that have uh, competent people who are who are uh, able to do the training that are certified to do the training. Right. So that's not really an issue. Right. And it, Teresa's law does also uh, call for a competency test at the end of that training to make sure that the staff are competent. Uh, the Lara had called for such a competency test. Uh, they said during their uh, investigations or their inspections that they're seeing over and over again that staff are not retaining what they're learning. So they said facilities really need to have that yearly competency. So Teresa's law would require that. Um, there was one other thought I had that I wanted to talk about, but it it's left me at the moment. But um, anyway, so... Um, I think the cost perspective um, is isn't really a major concern because, like Justine said, there is a lot of free training out there that that is uh, certified type training. And the um, the law does require certain kinds of training. Also, it's not it's not indiscriminate. Right. There are areas that the uh, direct care worker would would have to. Uh, take in order to uh, meet the requirements. So, you know, that's outlined also. Margie and then Bruce. Um, well, um, I, a lot's been said that I agree with. Um, and um, I, the, the, what you're proposing is, is certainly not sufficient. Um, uh, and I think the suggestion of maybe we should take some long-term care issues on as uh, a work group, um, because it every, every uh, long-term care facility has issues. And I mm -hmm. personally find uh, the fact that Washtenaw County has such poor long-term care, assisted living, et cetera. I, I just can't believe we stand for that. So I would I would like to see us take that on in some way. So I again I think the the bill is uh, falls short of what we need. But on the other hand, I boy, I I I don't know that um, uh, buying leverage is worth sacrificing some of the some improved standard at this time. I wonder if you could tell us what your next, if this passes, uh, what is your next move? How are you gonna how are you gonna go forward? What's next for you? Yes, sure. Um, so if this passes, uh, what we are uh, 
targeting for next session or after this bill would be um, quarter, uh, regarding the medication administration, the next uh, thing we would like to get implemented would be quarterly audits uh, of the medication records by a licensed professional. Uh, right now in nursing homes, 30-day uh, audits are required, and this is to uh, have a, a, a pharmacist or an RN come in. Well, actually, I think a nursing home is by a pharmacist, but they come in every month and uh, do a, an audit of the medication records, and that's of licensed staff that they're auditing. Right now, there is no oversight uh, that is required in assisted living. So that would be one, one of our uh, changes for, for next session would be quarterly audits uh, by uh, a pharmacist to come in and review those medical records, look for errors, and do any uh, education if they find errors. Uh, the other uh, piece that we have would be the accountability piece, and that is fines for repeated violations in those violations that cause serious harm or death of a resident. Uh, the other change we have uh, that we're going to advocate for is for cameras. Give, give residents the right to have uh, cameras in their rooms if they want them. Uh, that's something that they're trying to, I think there's a bill in Michigan right now to get those into nursing homes. And so we want to emulate or uh, that bill, but get it in for assisted living. So those are the uh, three major things that we're, we're advocating for. The other would be, this is a very long-term uh, goal, but we would like to see a certified medication aid role for assisted living. Um, that gives the direct care worker uh, a career, a chance for career advancement, something to work towards, and it would stable or standardize uh, the medication standards uh, across the board. But these are things that the the industry lobby is very powerful and influential, and they are. I mean, they really don't want any of this. They're they're even fighting against the transparency requirements that we have in this substitute bill of Teresa's law, and so at a minimum, we want to ensure that families are given this information before they sign a contract. Um, and some of that information is, what is the training that this particular home provides uh, for their direct care workers? And, and what's the depth and breadth of it? Just as an example, most places, at least our home did, will say that their staff is trained in medication administration. But really, what does that mean? Uh, did they just watch two online videos for 20 minutes? or did they send them to a three-day interactive uh, session? And so that's something we feel families uh, need to know before making a decision. And sometimes families don't think to ask those questions. I know we didn't. Um, and so, you know, this isn't, you're not buying a used car. We feel it's important that that information be disclosed up front. Um, another thing that is in our disclosure requirements that is very important is What's the certification of your staff that will be administering medications? Do you have licensed staff or do you not? Is it just a direct care worker that has you know, minimal training? It may be okay if residents can self-administer their own meds. That may be acceptable for some families, but you may have, uh, your loved one may need more care. They may not be able to self-administer their own meds. And so it may be important to you that you have a licensed uh, staff member to provide that. And so we just feel it's important to disclose that information to families and let them make that decision. Um, again, like I said, right now, at, at a minimum, 73% of the states do not allow unlicensed staff to pass medications. Uh, Michigan, you know, not only in our study, but other studies really is at the bottom in this area. And so, uh, but anyway, so we want to disclose as much of that information to families up front so they can, they can make an informed decision. And you know what's what's best for their for your loved one may be different for somebody else, but provide that information up front. Don't wait till somebody signed a contract and then you get in there and you find out all these issues. Can I add something, Pat? Oh, right yeah, now, sure. the um, facilities are not required to report errors. They um, at one time were, but no, they're no. That's no longer a requirement. So it's up to the family to. Um, complain uh, or to uh, have an ombudsman um, help them if they if they know how to find an ombudsman. And in terms of the transparency, uh, we want it put up in a public place where they can turn to uh, if they have a complaint, either uh, directly to Lara uh, or to uh, get help from an ombudsman 
or uh, to adult protective services. So that that is something that, and, and that that's part of the application process too, that people understand if problems come up, that they uh, have redressal. And um, so this isn't made uh, plain to people. People often don't know where to turn to uh, when a problem arises and they may feel even intimidated to even inquire about that. Um, but if they can seek an ombudsman, if they have that uh, recourse, the ombudsman can give them some support in, in troubleshooting, uh, whether they um, have the ombudsman do it for them uh, or they work along with that person, you know, they have, they can, they have a choice. So that's another important aspect of the uh, transparency. Thank you. Um, I do want to wrap this conversation up in the next five minutes so we can move on to the rest of our agenda. Phyllis, you haven't had a turn to speak yet, so I'm going to give it to you and then um, Bruce will have you go next. Okay, I just... Um... I, I hear the concerns of maybe we don't know enough. I mean, this is a huge area of um, importance that needs needs legislation to and improvement. I mean, this is. I worked in a nursing home in 1975. And I know what's been going on since then. So I, I understand that what Pat says, that there's a lobby against any regulation because they want to make money, they want to keep their money, and they don't want to bother with uh, regulations. So this is this is a good step and it's needed and so let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. we this is an important step and maybe as legislators find or um the whole industry finds that everybody wins from this step they might be more agreeable to to all the next steps uh, that you outlined. So I um, I think we should support it and we should support it now. And I like the idea of maybe as a body exploring other issues that are involved with long term care. Thank you, Bruce. Um, I'll, be, I'll, I'll be brief. Sorry about the barking dog. Um, I'm I'm encouraged by the fact that even though there's some short term differences in how we want to how we think we should proceed, that in the longer term we are more more in agreement than not about what we want to, that we need to have a greater impact. So my question is really related to the short term and it's more of a political question the assurances or the recommendations you are getting from legislators are those bipartisan are you getting people from both parties that are telling you to be you know to unroll the unwrap this and or unfold this in in parts or is it mostly coming from the democratic side the reason i ask that is that we don't know that we'll hold on to the house or the Senate going forward. Um, and if that happened, I don't know whether there's enough support, bipartisan support, to take the next steps together. So I think that's just a consideration in terms of, you know, the more cautious approach or the more incremental approach. Um, maybe there's a way to just move incrementally, but also increase our visibility and our voices around the more comprehensive work so that whatever the politics are going to be, we don't back down from from the from the broader goal. So um, I'm just wondering, is it bipartisan? 
So this is the information uh, that we got from the Families, Children, and Seniors Committee, which is comprised of you know both Democrats and Republicans. So that was feedback really that came across the board that they wanted to see it broken down into smaller pieces, more manageable pieces. And I will say just some final uh, comments on it is that change takes a, a lot of time. And uh, some of the feedback in addition to to what I spoke about earlier that we got is that take those incremental wins, get some of those in incremental changes. Uh, if you've been following the Biden administration's uh, changes or attempted changes to the nursing home, just trying to increase, I, I believe by like an hour, 1.5 hours um, for the time that the staff spends with a resident. It is, it's been going on for years, them trying to make that change. And so to say to, we're not going to make any changes until we get everything fixed, I think would be a colossal mistake. Uh, we have to take the wins where we can get them. The training and transparency would make a huge improvement. And then it would also give us that leverage to go in. We're raising awareness to legislators. We've had some of the members on the on the committee say to us, I thought I knew everything about this because they had gone through it, through it with one of their parents. And they said, you know, but until we had that lived experience and until I saw some of the legislation, the stats we put forth of the violations and the horrific reports that we've read, they're very hard to read. Uh, they had no idea. And so to say we're not going to make any improvements because the, there's too many problems, um, I think is a mistake. We have to take some wins. And right now we felt the most urgent need is to get the current training that they need right now that to do their jobs, not only for the direct care worker, but to protect residents. Uh, when my mom went into hypoglycemia, she was diabetic because the staff gave her her insulin an hour before she ate. The staff member didn't know what to do. She didn't even recognize it and didn't know what to do. You know, had we not been there, um, I don't know what would have happened. And, you know, we learned after my mom passed away that they were giving her her fast acting insulin more than an hour before she ate on multiple occasions. And so I do believe that's what caused her stroke and her death. And, and so we've read just so many reports on it uh, through the violations that, you know, there is an immediate need. And so I don't think we should look at it as a loss or a failure to say, we're not fixing all these problems. Legislation is hard to move through and it is a slow process. So to scrap this now and say, until we can you know, look at a bigger issue and, and bigger problems, I, I think we'd, we're, we're losing an opportunity here. We've brought this awareness now to the legislators. And I think if we get a success, it will help us you know, put forth those other changes that we wanna make. We're starting the ball rolling and it would be a positive win to get the training and transparency. It's not everything. It's not gonna fix all the problems, but it is going to help. And it's going to, like I said, start that process. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, everyone. So our our choices right now um, are to table this conversation for another time, um, to decide not to make an endorsement, or to motion for an endorsement. Um, the drafted endorsement we started on last time, um, it's in your agendas, motion for the Commission on Aging to endorse Teresa's Law HB 4841 and recommend the County Board of Commissioners to support Teresa's Law, a Michigan state law propose, proposal that requires additional training, support, and transparency for direct care workers to avoid preventable prescription and non-prescription medication errors in adult foster care homes. Uh, Phyllis, you need to unmute. I would like to um, move that motion that you just read. We have a second. second. Allison was second. Roll call vote. Yes, 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 you do. But Taylor? I'll tell you in just a moment. Sorry, I was unmuted. Yeah. Uh, or now I am. <laughs> Julia Ballard. Yes. Marta Larson.
Barda Larson. She's trying. Sorry, I was muted. I voted already, yes, but I'm voting again, <laughs> yes. Maria Gress. Yes. Margaret Reynolds. Yes. Elizabeth Thompson. Yes. Jennifer Green. Yes. Phyllis Herzig. Yes. Bruce Strain. Yes. Jennifer Hackendorn. Yes. Brenda McKinney. Jasmine Cooper. Yes. Allison Foreman. Yes. Annie Somerville. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you all so much. Thank you. We yeah, really appreciate it. And we'd really like to keep you um, informed in the future as we uh, move forward. Um, so um, that's something that you can uh, count on. Great. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So we're going to move on to subcommittee updates. Uh, communications, do you have any updates? Nope. No. Nope. Town Hall, probably no updates, but anything from Town Hall Committee? Nope. Great. Nope. Um, moving forward, future planning, millage. Um, I do have discussion planned on the Office on Aging presentation, but is there any other updates that you wanted to bring to the COA at this time? Just a clarification, Marie. Um, mm -hmm. The Office on Aging update, uh, I was a little, I'm a little confused because that term didn't even show up in the commission the board of commissioners discussion if i recall there was no there was a department of aging that was mentioned as part of the you know the county but yeah the it's just a language difference they they are talking about it as the department of aging services so my apologies i misspoke so that is the way that they're looking at it as a department of aging within the county that is currently how they are looking at it, yep. Okay, because I think that's different in the minds of some folks with regards to an office on aging. So I just mm -hmm. want to, you know, go on record with that. And I guess that will be part of our conversation, but that, because that was a concern, at least that I had, and I think other people had as well. Great, thank you. Any other updates from your subcommittee? Well, I think the main thing is, um, Phyllis and Jasmine and I spoke, and then we just debriefed a little bit around the um, the, the commission meeting. So since we're going to get into that lar larger discussion, I would say we can we can unless Phyllis or Jasmine. Um, I guess the final thing we, we we did talk about was some of the things that Gary mentioned in terms of clarifying the process and making sure we were a part of it. So those okay. were the kind of sentiments. Great. All right. Um, so up next then is the report from the Board of Commissioners. Annie, anything that you would like to share? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so I if you haven't watched um working session from last uh, month where we got a presentation from staff and there was comment from commissioner based on that presentation, I would encourage you to do that. Um there it was a a rough kind of um, I think recommendation from staff. Um, I do believe that there are commissioners who are interested in um, doing things not exactly as staff proposed. Um, and I would encourage the commission to share feedback um, with their commissioners from the district that they represent, um, as well as the at-large commissioners communicating with board members, both in the district that you live um, but also broadly, um, and we still have, you know, a lot of work to do to hammer out, um, details of how millage dollars will be spent if passed. Um, but I would just say, you know, use the next two months to, to share your feedback. Um, Annie, do you know the next time there would be a presentation to the board of commissioners on the senior millage 
items? I don't know the next time. Um, I know that we're going to have to have um, more deliberation um, as a board on the direction that we want to go into. Um, and uh, but right now, I don't know. Uh, I don't have the timeline. Um, obviously, the millage needs to pass first before we can take any action. Um, but uh, I do know that there's going to have to be um, at least at least at the very minimum um, another working session. Um, on this before the millage passes or do you think it'll happen after the millage passes um you know we have one one more meeting before that um and i i don't think we're ready to have another working session on it right now but okay. i know that um i've talked to a few commissioners about um our desires and so i for people who did watch you heard my feedback and you heard jason Matiaski's feedback about the desire to um use more funding for direct services um, with providers. So um, I think that uh, at least from the two of us, um, you'll see a concentrated effort to try to um, push for more uh, money in the buckets that were shared around um, services. Um, but the, yeah. Uh, it's it's everything is still very much um up in the air right now yeah yeah great thank you um anyone have questions for annie before we get into the good stuff i know everyone has lots of thoughts on this so uh we'll we'll scoot um to the the presentation on the um department of aging services um can those of you who did not have an opportunity to watch the presentation or look at the slides, could you just raise your hand? Four of you, okay. All right, then um, I will just very briefly share my screen um, to show you where you can find the information and then some of the, the stuff that's there just to kind of get everyone on the same page for this discussion. Let me find my shared screen. I want to share just that. So you can find um, the on if you go to YouTube and you search Washtenaw County Board of Commissioners, you can find the YouTube video that has the September 18th meeting and the first chunk is the working session and the working session was pretty much completely dedicated to the older person's service millage, um, a proposal. When you go to the county website, and this is the link that uh, Taylor shared with you, she actually shared the YouTube link and the link to the slides. If you click on the Department of Aging Services proposal, you can download the PDF or you can just view it in the browser to start looking through it. Um, this was the very first draft of what the um, department could look like. Right now they are um, proposing a department. Um, this very first draft, um, Andrew, the deputy administrator was the one doing the presentation. And he noted that just a few days before he had only given a sneak peek preview for feedback to Jason Machieski. So this is the first time the board of commissioners saw this. It was the first time the public saw this. Um, he is open to feedback, um, which I will be the purpose of our discussion in a moment. Um, but just so you can see what's in here, he reviewed the ballot language, the purpose of all of that. It's an eight-year um, term of authorization. Um, he has in here references on on what he looked at in putting this, again, first draft together. Um, and so let's just get to the meat of it. Um, so the summary is that there's a new county department of aging services. It will be funded through millage proceeds. I need to make your boxes smaller for a moment. Um, 
staffed by county employees as a department of a county it would need county employees it would be responsible for county programs that benefit those 60 plus um, both the direct programming and funding via contracts um, and then it would staff attend and receive advisement from the commission on aging this group he had three chunks in this first draft um, that he talked through, the programs funded through the department, the actual administration of the department, and then programs operated by the department. He has an organizational chart here. Um, you'll notice that there are a lot of county staff um, in this uh, proposal. This has been the biggest chunk of feedback that um, I've been hearing. I, I, clicking away those annoying apps. Okay, good. Um, this has been a number one piece of feedback that there's too many county staffers um, for this work um, with all of the nonprofits that currently have the clients, currently have that rapport, have the infrastructure, the experts, et cetera. Um, and so I know that this piece is under a lot of revision right now, um, but you can look at that in more detail on your own time. He does uh, have an initial summary of the budgets and staffing. Um, it's probably small on your screen since I'm sharing it right now, you can look through it in more detail um, on your own time. Implementation of priorities, if the millage is improved. Um, these are actions that the Board of Commissioners will be taking in the future. Should the millage pass, of course, so all this is contingent on the, the proposed millage. Next steps. Um, a piece that Andrew did not formally present on, but are in this packet, and I highly recommend that you do take time to look through some of his additional notes on this program detail. Um, he outlines the programs operated by the department. Currently, Foster Grandparents is one of those programs administered um, in OCED. Um, they are currently staffed at 1.7 FTE, and he's not proposing any changes in this first draft. Um, the budget estimate is same as what it currently is. So really, there's no changes besides moving this program to the Department of Aging Services. Um, there was a program, a Senior Minor Home Repair. Um, this would be a new program. Um, the operating model was based on OCED's weatherization and housing rehabilitation programs. Um, there is one program that I'm aware of currently in the community through Catholic Social Services doing minor home repair. And then Ypsilanti Meals on Wheels does um, some minor home repair with grants that they receive for their residents as well. And so those are some other um, pieces of feedback that I've heard are being passed to administration. There's a senior resource hub um, as a new program operated through this Department on Aging as presented in this initial draft um, to just be a call center and be a website that has services available in the county to have somebody available to call and direct you to those services. Um, current feedback is that it's it's too staff heavy for how we believe the number of calls we believe to come in. Um, but his model is based off of the Aging and Disability Resource Center. Um, he also noted that Catholic Social Services does have, it used to be called Ahead of the Curve, and I don't remember what they renamed it. Um, just a few more, and then I do wanna open us up for discussion. Um, programs funded through the department, um, currently senior nutrition programs, both congregate meals uh, and Meals on Wheels fall underneath senior nutrition. Um, it currently has 2.4 FTE, and in his budget, he's not recommending any additional staffers. Um, they are, he was recommending uh, without 
going to like actually pricing out all the meals and and all the various things. He's estimating an additional two million of the millage dollars to increase the current one point one million. So that whole program would be seeing three point one million for staffing, no current staff changes, and then food um, to our residents in Washtenaw County. And then, of course, that would currently exist in OCED, and the proposal would be moving that to the Department of Aging Services. Senior Center financial support, um, recommending that $2 million be going to senior centers. Um, this is based off of Commissioner Maciejewski's recommendation of 200000 to each senior center in the county. There was discussion on what constitutes a senior center. They were talking about accreditation, and just so everyone is clear, accreditation of senior centers is no longer a thing. As of 2023, the NCOA no longer accredits senior centers, but there are other ways that the commissioners did talk about that exist, like the Michigan Association of Senior Centers having municipal support or um, even just a letter of support that this is our local senior center as ways to say that this is, you know, to keep the dollars with um, vetted senior centers. There was a proposal for legal aid through the county. There was um, the rest of the dollars go to an RFP process. And so currently that looks like 3.5 um, million in the general RFP. Um, on the second slide for RFP, he uh, does note that um, they have not done a lot of discussion on possible services and programs. They haven't discussed priorities here yet. And that's sort of what I'm really interested in this body discussing um, is those priorities. But we can get back to that in a bit. The committee proposal. Um, so who is going to look at the RFP? I know there's been a lot of questions on how that will look. How will these dollars be decided? Um, right now, the proposal is three commissioners, one county admin, the director of this department, and then four Commission on Aging members is the current proposal. And then the administration of the department itself. Um, planning will be a piece. Um, communications, there's been a lot of talk um, about people just not knowing what's out there. And so having a communications person can help disseminate that information. Um, and then administrative tasks, of course. And then the Commission on Aging, they are proposing that this commission have a dedicated staffer from the county and um, I believe some dollars to support initiatives that we're interested in, like the town halls we do annually, um, an annual meeting and things of that nature. Um, I'm going to stop my share. Um, there was robust discussion on this. So I really do recommend, even though we just did a high level overview right now that you go back and you watch the videos. Um, I'm going to open up my notes. Anything else I wanted to say before I see everybody's hands go up? Um, I did invite Andrew to come to our November meeting, November 1st meeting, um, to update us on what may what feedback he's been getting and what changes may be implemented. Um, and that will be an opportunity for us to formally give this feedback we talk about today to him as well. Um, but I do wanna just get the ball rolling. I wanna hear your thoughts, um, feedback that you have, whether it's on the department, if it's on the priorities. Um, I do ask that you remember that this was the first iteration um, and so I would appreciate while there's there's a lot of um, big feelings <laughs> about how some of this is structured, that all of your comments on this and recommendations be um, respectful, that they be framed as either questions or recommendations, requests for him to consider um, or the Board of Commissioners to consider going forward. Um, so with that, I want to just open up the floor for discussion.
Who wants to share their thoughts first? Gina. Thanks. Um, I, I was trying to follow along and I, I am going to go and um, watch it myself so I can always like take more time into that as, as well. But it looked like that they were allotting some budget out of the millage money to staffing that already exists, like and in theory is already funded. So like senior nutrition and um, there was one more that I, I picked up on, but um, that's the one that stood out to me. So is, you know, are, are they proposing to divert current funding that already goes to senior nutrition coordination and pay it out of the millage? That's a great question. Um, any other comments? And then I'll move to Bruce and Elizabeth. I see your hand so you can rest it and not have to hold it. <laughs> Bruce? Um, I appreciate both your quick overview, Marie. And, I, um, and even though I disagreed a fair amount. I thought Andrea actually did quite a decent mm -hmm. job of um, presenting, you know, in a thoughtful way. And um, I look forward to communicating with them both, you know, in the short term, but more importantly, I think, hopefully, hopefully after the millage has passed, because there is a lot of work to do and a lot of ways to think about it. And, you know, we've been invited and encouraged to do homework and to share it. And my overriding question and, and comment is, I, I think we need to come up with a process for pulling our thoughts together and priorities together as a, as a board, but then also how do we share them on an on, what, through an ongoing process that is not just, you know, a one-time downloading of some questions or some comments, because I think it it really needs us to be rolling up our sleeves and working together as much as we can. There is a lot of good information out there that Andrew, I don't believe, is necessarily aware of. And I wouldn't expect him to be because he's not an aging expert. But there is a lot of really good information that I think we could help to bring together and to share it. But I worry that a lot of this is kind of, you know, either public comments are short and every few weeks or every few months. And then there are some additional processes that allow for some talking to our individual commissioners or maybe even a small group meeting like um, Marie said, but I really worry to be to address things like independence and innovation and a multi-phased um, look at the work takes real time and people really a real working group. And I would I would welcome, and I'll stop with this, but I would welcome the opportunity post election to really think about what that should look like and what's the best way for us individually and collectively and the people we represent to get our our best ideas to the commission and to work with them to figure out a model that really feels right for Washtenaw County. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, several points. I totally agree. I'm very concerned that it looks like we're supplanting existing dollars with millage dollars. And I feel there should be no supplement. Anything dollars raised by the millage should go to pay additional services or if required additional staff. Uh, Bruce's point is very telling, we need to have some way that we continue in an advisory capacity working with this new entity in the county other than just reviewing RFPs. And I don't know what that would look like, but I think there's a lot of expertise here that could be used. I don't know the difference in county speak between a department and an office. When I was in state government, there was a significant difference. An office just focused on programs. A department was a significant increase in bureaucratic structure. I don't know what that means in a county. 
but I would be concerned if the department um, means that a lot of funding or really any funding is going to an expansion on administrative capacity because I feel pretty confident that the existing staff that deals with grants can monitor um, the ongoing process of the implementation of RFPs. I agree that having some capacity to provide information and referral is good. We've talked about how people just don't know about services, but I am concerned that they're not looking at using existing services. Uh, for example, possibility of expanding the role of Catholic social services in that INR capacity. So I feel overall, uh, we should look at directing financial resources to existing programs that are doing the work. Though I really like the idea of the senior financial repair issue as a new program. And it seems to me that could relatively be administered by the folks who already administer some of the home repair programs through OCD. The communication piece, um, Again, I'm not sure new staff needs to be there. Uh, maybe as they look at the RFP structure, one of the things that could be looked at is could say Meals on Wheels, because I look at Allison, so I immediately think of Meals on Wheels. Um, could they apply for some funding that they use to expand their communication and outreach efforts um, rather than creating new staff. And I don't know what they mean by program planning. Um, and again, right now, my feeling is I would like to see money going directly to services. As few staff as possible. I love the idea that we as a commission could get some support, but I don't think we really need a full-time staff member to do that. Uh, maybe part-time. I like the idea that we would get some modest funding to do some programming ourselves. And this is not to say that there might not be in the future, support around a countywide plan for seniors. But right now, I think to start out with, um, it would be good to just focus the money on the services because much of our testimony over the last two years as people describing the holes in providing services because we there are no financial resources. And one final thing, and then I promise I'll be quiet, um, is I know we've frequently talked about transportation and respite care as being two big things often provided by senior center. Chelsea has a respite care program in their senior center. Um, I hope that when the RFP process is developed, it is based on some of the work we've already done uh, about service gaps in our county. I'm done now. Thanks, Margie. Yeah, well, sort of um, bouncing off Elizabeth's last point, um, uh where where was the um strategic plan in all of this where is the work from uh the Annaber area community foundation in this have we have we used it do we know what it is um i i it seems like that would be key in developing 
uh, this how how the department is going to focus its attention and how how we're going to use the money. I don't know where where that is. Can you? Does anybody? Um, all I know is that Chris has held back on full dissemination of it um, for reasons he can better explain, strategic reasons. Um, I know that he has shared it with some stakeholders. I don't know that it was one of the items that Andrew referenced, and that's a really good um, question, and I, I wrote it down. That's good. Allison and then Bruce. Like most people, I had big feelings about this. Um, I had planned to go in person. I'm actually kind of glad I was at home watching it. <laughs> so um, I think Andrew did a great job for a start. And I will, I want to echo when Gary came on and spoke during public comment. I thought that was a really great response that this is a great starting point. And mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of work that we have to do with this and, and prioritizing. Um, I too much like Dina, Dina had said that, are they going to take money from senior nutrition that had been funded through a different format? And is it now going to come out of the millage for that? Because that is a significant amount of money. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, from a priority perspective, I know a lot of states are starting to work on this. I don't know where Michigan is at on it, but a lot of um, states are starting to mandate if you're getting certain types of service that there is mandatory case management for every person that you touch. This is something that's going on in Ohio right now that by 2026, they may mandate if you get home delivered meals, I also have to do case management for every person that is touched by that. If that's something that could be coming down the line in the state of Michigan, that might then become a priority that we have to address. Um, considering how many seniors we have, if you're touching everyone and have to do a level of case management, that could be very costly. So it could be something for consideration, much like with when we're considering a strategic plan for that. So I think that's, I didn't see a lot of case management represented in this. And so that is one priority area I kind of think would be important to add. And I'm going to leave it at that because there's plenty of other stuff that I could comment on, but that was, I think your focus, you wanted to talk about some priorities. Yeah. Thank you. Bruce. Um, first, just a quick question of clarification. Um, the term they've, they've discussed that, and we know it's an eight year plan if it, if it passes um, and they've used the figure of 11 million is that 11? I'm assuming that's 11 million per year. Um, that's the projection. Um, right. I know right. it changes every year. I'm not a millage expert, but I know that the exact amounts change a little bit every year because it's based on property taxes. Right. Um, and then also looking at Andrew's budget, um, there is still he when you look at the budget slide, there was one column with a ton of information and that was millage dollars. When you look at the second um, column, that's a little bit more sparse. That is state and federal funds that come into the county to support these programs. And the third one is the, the total. And so that total ends up being um, 12.7 just for funsies. Good information. Go ahead, Bruce. So, so you know, I think we would be within a reasonable range to, to say that over an eight year period, there's gonna be at least somewhere in the neighborhood of a hundred million dollars that would be dedicated to senior millage. And it might be a little higher based on property values and things or other, and it could go a fair amount higher in terms of our ability to leverage. And my point is that if we really looked at all the important priorities and they're only going to get more expensive and they're only the numbers are only going to get more daunting given the, the demographics, if you started to add up what it was going to cost for caregiving, for home repairs, for transportation, you know, oh, in, in just in just Washington County, it would be in the billions and billions of dollars. So the question is, in terms of how we strategically think about this opportunity we have, hopefully, 
um, to leverage and to basically grow um, the not just the resources, but the kind of community-based structure or support the, the community-based structure that we feel good about. Those are different kinds of questions than just allocating our which priorities we feel are the most important, because I'm not sure we're ever going to agree on whether feeding people is more important and transporting people is more important than coordinating care for people. Um, it just goes on and on and on. So I think to be as strategic as we can about how we think about using this opportunity to really build something, including build resources, but build a community approach and community support or what's going to be such an important issue. Um, I think that's why Biden had billions of dollars, many hundreds of billions of dollars earmarked for care, including senior care. And I'll conclude with, with this. Um, there is a lot of good information. The good news is there's a lot of really good information at the national and state level, and to some degree in, in Michigan, and to some degree even in some of the counties. So there's a lot of really good resources to pull from. Um, and I don't think we have to start from scratch. I think we could get together some very useful ideas and recommendations, um, especially in what they're referring to as that runway period, the period after the millage and until the first funds come available in 2026. So I would just say that I'm happy to, I've been doing a lot of research on that and there is some very, very good use and useful information. Thank you. Uh, Dina, then Annie, then Jennifer. Yeah, I I want to just echo a lot of things that Bruce said. I, I think um, one of the most important things that we can recommend is that there, there is an actual strategic planning process and, you know, inviting the, you know, people who have access to, you know, the information that goes into strategic planning. I mean, you know, like the Anna Rary Community Foundation, for example. Um, you know, I also think, you know, one of the things that strikes me as as um, an area that that we should be recommending is that I think that we should be looking at what are the existing um, resources and, you know, can we enhance those resources rather than creating a new one? You know, um, the 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 senior resource hub that is that is mentioned in the proposal, you know, is not doesn't sound entirely different than what two one one can do is supposed to do. Same with Ageways. Um, you know, and they these are resource these are you know entities that provide resources. So, um, you know, are there are there is there Funding that is needed to enhance what already exists, I think would be a much smarter question than simply saying, let's create another source that people can get information from. Uh, you know, my one, you know, area that I, I want to really emphasize is that, you know, um, I agree that there is it's a challenge to sometimes know what information is available in the community, but I'm going to say that the big bigger challenge is is like navigating that and navigating all of the resources that you need access to. So handing somebody a list of phone numbers is not going to cut it. And that's what I hear when I hear a senior resource hub. Yeah. Thank you. Annie, then Jennifer. Thanks. Um... Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I appreciate the comment about the Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation mapping. Um, I was thinking that during the presentation, like we haven't gotten that yet. Um, at least I haven't. Um, and I also think that Maria, and maybe I didn't hear it. Um, and so in the presentation that we got from Andrew, there's the bigger bucket proposed for like a broad RFP and then there was a bucket for senior centers and a bucket for nutrition. The senior center one and the nutrition one, I think, was $2 million. Um, the comment that I shared at the meeting related to the senior um, center funding, um, and I don't know if everybody had a chance to watch that, but um, I'm interested in making sure that money gets distributed in an equitable way um, and that not all um, senior centers might need or, or get the same amount um, 
based on other funding streams. And so I, I am just sharing that here with the group because I don't think that um, just based on like population capacity that it should be a blanket amount. And so just offering that as my feedback. And then Annie, you had um, a housing suggestion. Could you share that with this group too? The eviction thing? Oh yeah. So I think towards the end of the meeting, I, I just like, I did share with my colleagues that I think this millage is an opportunity for us to prevent um, the older adult homelessness. Um, I don't know what that looks like. Obviously we have a huge housing crisis in Washington County and we're making decisions all the time to try to prevent evictions and, and rapidly rehouse people. But um, one of the cool things about the veterans millage is they have um, the ability to almost on demand help people who are veterans who become um, unhoused. And so I would like, you know, like us to be able to have a structure in place where we can do everything possible to prevent um, older adults from eviction or foreclosure. I know that we have programs for people with poverty exemptions, but sometimes people are just outside of that and can't. And I just want to make sure that we can um, prevent prevent further um, displacement for people who are old, older adults. So um, I don't know what that looks like. I just think that it's an opportunity for us to be smart about um, the, the difference in preventing than what the cost would be once we have to try to rehouse somebody who already becomes homeless. Thank you. Jennifer, then Margie. Uh, yes, I wanted to just reiterate what Elizabeth has said about uh, our role as COA and uh, just looking at RFPs, reading our, I mean, our grants. And I know we had some discussion in previous meetings about what our role would look like with working with this department. But I didn't know, if someone can remind me, where did we land? Did we land somewhere on what we wanted our role to be? Yeah, so our role doesn't change. Our role is to define the needs of and advocate on behalf of senior 60 plus and uh, including equitable well-being, quality of life opportunities, et cetera, et cetera, as well as making recommendations on the spending of public funds. In Andrew's presentation um, on the org chart, it was probably too small for your screens on my share, but Commission on Aging is right there. And the, the Department of Aging Services had an arrow supporting the Commission on Aging and then um, an arrow back from the Commission on Aging supporting the department. So there's an, going to be an ongoing relationship um, there. The thing he specified was with the RFPs that they would be picking members from the Commission on Aging to help with that process. Um, but the Commission on Aging and the work we're doing now will, will continue and be more supported. Does that help, Jennifer? It does. I would just like to see us have a stronger advisory role with that Great. department. Uh, Margie, then Bruce. Um, you know, I just want to um, follow up on, I can't remember who said, do all uh, senior centers get the same amount, um, mm -hmm. depending on their, maybe it's more related to their funding stream. One of the things that I hear or have heard for for some time from um, citizens is, and and I think through our conversations, we need to make sure that the out county areas have sufficient funding. They never have, and um, and and uh, for various reasons. But we really need to make sure this that they get what they need and um, so just want to reiterate that yeah thank you margie bruce um that's a, always a good point to remind ourselves of margie the the equitable side of the work um and i think that's that's really something we have to keep in mind and really work on i wanted to just make one point about the um language, because I think it's really important. Um, 
I, had, I appreciated the earlier comment about it, the, the distinction between an office and a department. But I think there's another way to look at it. I don't think we are, I would like to have us think about something that's neither a traditional office or a traditional department in the sense that a department can be more powerful than an office. But in this case, a department is also located within an existing governmental entity, which has its pluses, but it also has some real minuses, particularly around the role of being real advocates at times. I think it's much more complicated to advocate sometimes within government, although government can be progressive and can be very, you know, very good in how it thinks about that stuff. But I think the best change happens when there's good advocacy, both within government and outside of government. And what I'm hoping for is that we'll look at a model for all of what we want, an office or whatever, but that is as independent and collaborative but as independent as possible so that we can raise the extra money, raise our concerns, raise our voices, and work as a you know, real true advocate for, um, for the population and for the county. And I think it's somewhat different from just a more traditional model that Andrew was drawing on, which I understand that's, that's his reference. Um, but I think that that's something we should really take the time to think about and how it could be as independent and innovative as possible and still be a really good partner. Thank you. Any other comments? So will we have time to get together before we meet with Andrew? Um, so I suppose, well, all right, let me think a moment on how I want to structure my thought. So I'm going to take some of this initial feedback um, and feedback that I've been hearing from um, others as well as my own feedback because I have a lot. Um, I'm going to be meeting with Andrew on the 17th. Um, and then hear sort of, you know, what what sort of evolution has happened since his presentation, because I know he has been receiving a lot of feedback and he wanted to be implementing some of that as he goes. Um, and so then he will come and do an updated presentation to this group on November 1st. Um, and we'll have an opportunity then. I, we're not going to schedule any other presenter, or any other discussion item. It'll just be focused on um, this particular piece. Um, as far as this group getting together again before that, we don't have a planned um, meeting for that. There is the, the subcommittee um, planning moving forward millage subcommittee that um, would likely meet between now and then. I don't know their schedule for sure. And if they have capacity for more COA members to join them, then you're more than welcome to do it in that forum. Um, yeah, any other, did that answer your question, Margie? Well, yeah, but we we really can't join them um, if they're talking about, I mean, because there are too many of us. Um. Bruce and Phyllis and Jasmine have been the primary people meeting. I know there's a couple of others that are on there, but they haven't always joined. And so there's room for three more commissioners to join their next yeah, meeting. Al Allison's been pretty regular. Oh, and Allison, I'm sorry. So two more commissioners to join their meeting. I would like to. Great. Elizabeth, I see your hand. Yeah, I'd be interested as well. And my thinking was, is we've noticed the impact when we can come together and produce a document that captures all our thoughts and share it. Um, and I'm wondering how we might be able to facilitate that because um, certainly getting the feedback, Marie, that uh, you're going to compile from this meeting and sharing it directly with Andrew is great, but we 
The individual commissioners also have a role in adding their thinking to it. And I don't quite know the best way to um, capture our thoughts and come together with comments that can also be shared with commissioners. And I also don't know what the time frame mm -hmm. is after the millage, which I'm going to be optimistic and say the millage passes, um, what the time frame is that the board of commissioners will be making decisions. And maybe if we knew that, that might help inform us thinking about <laughs> how how we move forward. Yeah, um, I asked Annie earlier if she knew what the timeline was going to be, and she didn't think that they were going to have another working session on this until after the millage. Um, and so I think when we know the timing of that next working session and when their decisions need to happen, I agree that would be the time where we we have our, our typical document um, to pass up um, where we formally make a recommendation as the Commission on Aging to pass up. Um, I just don't want to do it too soon. And then the things that we have to recommend are now moot because things have changed, right? Um, I want to be really strategic about that. And I always have a one pager in mind. <laughs> Marie, um, you, go just ahead. a quick question would, on process. Would it be helpful if we could do our subcommittee meeting before you met with Andrew, so we could share whatever comes out of that as well. Is that something that would, yeah, yeah, you're, you gave it a, definitely. Day or a couple of days to incorporate, but okay. Yep. I'm mean, just thinking of timing. Yep. Yep. So I'm meeting with him on uh, the 17th. Okay. So, so we could you could have your comments the 15th or 16th to me, that would be really helpful. Okay, we'll try to set up something if we can before then. Great. Um, and then Elizabeth, you also mentioned talking to individual commissioners. Um, and okay. Annie had mentioned that too as something that can be very impactful. Even if like we don't have a full formalized plan, there are things that were um, shared that you know we can start talking to our commissioners about. We can talk to additional commissioners about. There's nothing stopping us from talking a commission to a in our district. Um, so be while we as a group are are making a formal compilation of our thoughts and recommendations. You as individuals, please talk to your commissioners especially when you listen to that meeting, if your commissioner um, made comments that you feel like don't really align with uh, the district you share, um, I would really recommend that you reach out to those individuals, invite them to go do a Meals on Wheels run, invite them to hang out at the senior center for the day, um, ask them to do a tour of Jewish family services uh, or Catholic social services, right? Um, exposure really helps change minds um, and mindsets. And so um, that would, it would really be beneficial if everybody was reaching out to their commissioner about that. Yeah, Phyllis, I see your hand. Oh, you're muted. I'm wondering uh, if we could then move the um, subcommittee meeting to the Friday before your, your 18th meeting. So that's, um, what I, I had the date in the moment. Um, the 11th. 11th. Um, does that work for those of you that want to attend? Yep. November? Uh, October, it would October. be October 11th. Next week, Friday. That's Next Friday. Oh, that's yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I could come for a while. I have to leave about 1030 if you're talking. So we usually just meet. I mean, in the past, we've only met for an hour and, and at nine at nine at, at nine nine. Yeah, um, um, due to time. 
you can move the rest of the the timing of your session to email. That would that would be great. It's eleven oh one. Bruce, I see your hand. Um, Just a very quick reminder, adding to your list of things that people can do. Since nothing's really going to get resolved in terms of priority issues and stuff until after the millage, I just want to recommend that the most recent flyer from the Say Yes folks is still very solid in terms of if you want to talk to anybody between now and election time and share anything. So the, the most updated version has got a lot of really good information on one page. Yeah, there's, there's a whole page of, I don't know, a dozen or 15 points mm -hmm. to share with people. You can send them out to your networks, if you will, um, yeah. to ed educate and inform. Yep, right? educate and inform. Very good. <laughs> Um, all right, so our next meeting is November 1st as a full commission. Um, the presentation that time will be Deputy Admin Andrew DeLue um, on the Department on Aging and Millage Priorities. Um, motion to adjourn? So Margie? Moved. Yeah, so move. Who was second? I'm sorry. Elizabeth, Elizabeth second. Great. Um, all right. Thumbs up. We don't have to do a roll call. Great. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.